Triangulation is a simple concept, yet it has limitations that need to be understood. Triangulation can be carried out with any direction finding equipment like antennas. In um, our case here, we'll be using optical um, instruments, namely a camera or two cameras to be exact. And um, as you can see in the graphic, there is some uncertainty due to um, the measuring equipment. And that un uncertainty translates into an error ellipse in the location of the target. And the farther out that we push the instrument, the larger the error ellipse. And for our camera <clears throat> and the lens that I'll be using the 50 millimeter focal length, um, and given the pixel pitch of the sensor, um, I have an uncertainty of about um, 0 0.0000784 radians. And that translates to a range of uh, 12,755 miles to infinity. <laughs> so the instrument is useless beyond that, you know. And so you may be wondering, like, why would I even be trying something like this, you know. But um, just out of curiosity, I said, I'm going to try it, see what happens. And um, I'm also hoping that by integrating and taking uh, multiple images, um, I can reduce and average uh, the data to get better um, resolution, sub-pixel resolution. Now, once we um, determine the angle A, okay, then we can use the equation uh, we see there. And when we're going for things in the distance, um, for small angles, it is just D over A. D is the baseline. So... I'm pretty excited. So I'm recording at night. Here's one of my cameras. And uh, there's my car. Oh, starry night. And the other one is about a mile down there. And I didn't see any signs over here, but I looked at my kilometer I mean my odometer so I'm doing 30 exposures I missed a few because I had to drive over here but uh, I'm looking at the at the mountain oh, this is gonna be good man this is going to be good There's my timer right there. It's hanging. Oh, it's gonna be good. This is gonna be good. This is right there. It's my timer. I have two identical ones. I didn't get the camera quite level. It's all messed up. I hate this stand. It's so annoying. But anyway, I got a tower there to align. This is gonna be good. Okay, so. Mile marker six. There's my camera right there. See, mile marker six. Whoa, turned off. So my second my camera, camera on the right was left unattended and I actually flipped up the screen so <laughs> people would, would not see this light and maybe stop and take my camera. But uh, there is my camera right there and I started both of those at this location okay and then put the other camera in my uh, car and drove up the road um, about a mile um, uh, just looking at the odometer and um, you know set up real quick so i missed a few frames in the process so here's the diagram of my experiment so i used two cameras uh, separated by 1.177 miles. I had to actually go back and drive um, 
and, and get the distance more accurate. And I use my la laser rangefinder as well. <clears throat> but uh, this is to scale uh, on the map exact distances. Okay, so we will determine the angle um, A. And after we have the angle A, then we can correct the images and align the cameras so they're parallel. Okay, and once they're parallel, then we can get, um, you know, the angles to different um, stars out there and do the calculations. So, but there's more work. We also have to think about uh, elevation. And notice at the uh, top there on the left, um, we have to correct for the baseline, um, there's a 15 degree angle between the road, the Tecopa road, and the direction towards the tower. And I actually aligned on the tower. So I'll show you some images now of how I extract the data. So I chose this mountain, Mount Potassi, because there is an antenna uh, tower on top and uh, it has this red light beacons and I'll tell you later why that's very important and so I um, bring in two images from the two cameras and then I copy one onto the other and I um, turn the transparency to about 50 and then I shift them and align them all right, so as you can see here, we can get, uh, that, that looks pretty good. Yeah, maybe, maybe in between this position and the other one. Actually, this one looks pretty good. So just visually, I align the two images, and then I begin to measure the distance between, um, um, you know, the stars as seen by the two cameras. And here it's very tricky. You have to, there's not a whole lot of stars but when they overlap it's hard so there's three in a triangle so i actually enable visibility and i and i uh, kind of memorize so there's nothing there boom there they are one two three and so um then i just start measuring the distance between the two and here i notice my screen grab is not showing the dimensions on the bottom but it's about 840, uh, 849 pixels. Um, so lots of stars, lots of data. So I took 30 frames, but I lost like about seven for one of the cameras as I was driving to the other location. So I only have about 22 useful ones, but I measured about five, eight stars. And so, you know, Let's say 10. If I do 10 uh, times 20, you know, I'll have like 200 data points. Uh, but I actually um, just analyzed about uh, 70 or so, and I realized the statistics are actually pretty good, as you'll see. <laughs> it will blow your mind. Yes, my friends, I have done it. Before we look at the data, here's the map. Um, so we're going to zoom in and look at the towers as well. It's very critical that we get the dimensions uh, um, accurate. So there's the uh, the tower um, FM uh, station up there. And um, here we're going out to mile marker 6. That was the camera on the right. And... Um, we will uh, have a look in street view. Let's see. There it is, right there. Yep, mile marker six. So um, now the other location uh, did not have a plaque. And so I ended up driving uh, the next day going back and forth. I used my laser range finder and um, I um, I got the distance to point, uh, what was it, point oh one of a mile. So here's Mount Potassi, here's um, the station, 
where is it there we go and uh, let's look at uh, the photos available here's the tower you can see the shadow on the ground let's go up here yep. there we go so there's the tower and uh, yeah it has uh, the lights on it and that enabled us to align the images so pretty cool and i'm out there somewhere out there so here's the graphic uh, to illustrate why everything is important so the baseline along the copa road is 1.177 miles okay and um, there's a 15 degree um, change there in the direction of the towers okay so we adjust for that and we get 1.137 mile baseline um, okay towards the tower so that's very important all the small adjustments are important then the distance um, as seen from the top is 17.32 uh, miles the yellow uh, triangle on the ground to the right side um, camera okay then the difference in elevation is about 5300 notice that there's a slight elevation between left camera and right camera so average is like 3150 okay the tower is uh, 8455 uh, yeah so it's about 5300 feet and we use that with the 70.32 miles to get the 3.32 degree uh, difference okay so we can get the slant range to the tower of 17.04 miles now since this angle is so small the angle alpha or a which is 0 0.066725 um, you know uh, the uh, the difference between an arc segment and the chord is actually very small so the d over a approximation will hold now this angle alpha or, or a um, when divided by the angular resolution of one pixel uh, which is 0 0.000784 produces an incredible 851.1 uh, pixels 851.1 well when i was measuring the stars i was getting around um, 847 48 sometimes 49 sometimes 46 and it just blew me away i said whoa that is incredible anyway this angle alpha is the angle that if we shift the image um, by that amount then the two cameras are calibrated and exactly perpendicular but we don't really have to do that uh, we just take the difference between the distance um, of the stars you know that we measure and uh, 851.1 and that gives us the difference um, in angle from the stars to the antenna and uh, what i found out just blew me away folks have a look at this i plotted all my data in a histogram and uh, found the average 847.63 pixels standard deviation and the confidence interval and uh, plugged that into my equations and i was blown away the celestial dome distance is 4,200 miles away. Just incredible, folks. Within a 95% confidence, we can say that the distance is between 3,800 and 4,600 or so. Just incredible, folks. And this was only... Um, nine images i still have more and if i analyze it uh, uh, more and gather more data i'm only going to tighten that confidence interval this is incredible folks what does this mean we saw that the sun uh, in my previous analysis 
uh, came out to about the same distance. <laughs> yes, my friends, things are very mysterious out there. Yeah, I have done it, folks. Anybody that wants the data, I can give it to you and the images. This is truth, folks. I Some people think I'm trolling you. I smile and laugh at times, but I am serious about science. As um, the Flat Earth community believes, there is a dome. <laughs> the holographic dome. I have measured the distance to the celestial dome by utilizing synchronized stereo astrophotography and they have taken notice. I was told in no uncertain terms that we can punch through the dome and keep going forever, forever and ever. After taking the astrophotos I've returned with the theodolite to make accurate angular measurements. Measuring the angles directly increases the accuracy significantly. We will need these angles for calibration as you'll see shortly. Both of the cameras were separated by about a mile and they were pointed in the general direction of a tower on top of Mount Potosi. And that is our calibration target. There's my timer right there. Both of the cameras were time synchronized and started at one location. Then I took one of the uh, cameras in my car and drove it to the other location. After taking the photos, I marked uh, this location for camera one by putting a rock inside that uh, stump so I could find it the next day for uh, further analysis. You see that? I set my... Uh tripod I zeroed it out right on that bottle after taking the astro photos I returned with the theodolite to measure the angles accurately I have a two arc second theodolite and uh, at one of the locations I put up a rock and a bottle as you can see here and this is what I'm doing I'm using a theodolite to measure angles B and C to um, a very high accuracy and I'm using the calibration target a tower on top of the mountain after measuring the angles uh, B and C we can calculate A by using the formula you see there so A would be 180 minus B minus C once the calibration angle is determined, we'll use it to align the cameras. In this case, we rotate camera one um, by that angle so that its optical axis is parallel to the other one. So now we have a parallel set of uh, cameras properly uh, aligned and we're ready to uh, measure the distance to the stars or to any other objects in the imagery like um, airplanes and satellites. Triangulation is a common yet powerful technique to determine distance to a target. The range to which an object can be resolved is dependent on the separation of the cameras, called the baseline, and the angle accuracy that uh, we have. As you can see in the diagram, the farther out the measurement, the larger the uncertainty. For my setup, I used two Sony Alpha cameras with identical lenses and sensors. So 50 millimeter focal length and the pixel pitch is 3.92 micrometers. And so the angular resolution given these parameters is 0 0.0000784 radians. And if we take that angle and plug it in the equation, D over A, 
where it is one mile, we get a range of about 12,000 miles. So the instrument is useless beyond that, you know. And as you can see, you know, the closer you measure something, the more accurate it is. Less uncertainty in the position. Um, so we can definitely improve the experiment, go um, farther out, uh, separate the cameras by a larger distance. If we double D, then we can get to, you know, 20, um, 24, 25 thousand miles. Um, we can also increase the uh, focal length of the lens, but they get more expensive and also they're not fast lenses. So I've done a lot of thinking and calculating and looked at exposure times and lenses. There's a lot that I'm leaving out, but uh, I didn't just, uh, <laughs> you know, just go out and and do this experiment. Uh, there was a lot of thought that was uh, put into it. With the mountain. And Here I've rotated over to the mountain after zeroing on that bottle. So it's about 72 degrees, etc. And um, you see in the image two towers. Two of them on the right are actually overlapped, and the lights are on the left one, as uh, you probably saw in the images. Now, uh, the Theodor light is a really great instrument, um, two arc second uh, resolution, and so this frees us from having to determine angle A based on the distance D and, uh, you know, maps. This is actually very accurate. This map illustrates why we're only seeing two towers in the images from uh, side two on the right. Tower 2 and 3 are actually overlapped in the line of sight. So that's why only 2 appear. And we're focusing the Teora light on Tower 1. And that's where the red lights, the beacon lights, are located. That will use to align the images. Well, here we go. I set up here. I zeroed it out. I'm aiming at the sign. So now I'm measuring angle B and I start by um, aligning to the mile marker, that green plaque you see there, and zeroing out the instrument and then rotating to the mountain. And it's very, this is very critical. We have to get the angle just right as uh, you'll see next. Let's talk about accuracy. To gain a sense of what we're up against, uh, one pixel is equivalent to 0 0.000074 radians, which is equal to 16 arc seconds. And the Theodor light has a re resolution of 2 arc seconds. So we're doing really good. But when we align, okay, at one mile, um, one pixel is equivalent to about 5 inches. And this uh, mile marker is about 6 inches. So... We have uh, good enough accuracy. Um, optically, I can align it uh, within prob probably an inch at that distance. Now, at 17 miles, one pixel is equivalent to about 7 feet. Okay, so as long as we stay, you know, uh, within uh, a foot or so along the line of sight, we're not changing the angle alpha out there. The reason for this is illustrated in the lower left inset. Um, multiple triangles can share the same vertex. And so the surveying marker, this bottle, um, had to be moved out because there's bushes in the way. So that's why this was done. So that's okay. As long as we stay along the line of sight, um, we can still calculate the angle alpha prime which is our calibration or alignment angle that we're after and so i estimate that uh, the marker positional accuracy is better than 0.1 pixels as this figure illustrates okay so i rotate it and it's 256 1645 so after completing the measurements, I used the equations in the top left corner to calculate the angle A prime, which is the calibration angle. The calibration tower sits at an elevation of about 3.3 degrees, 
and it is A prime that uh, is the calibration angle. Um, even though they're fairly close, that's uh, pretty uh, significant. So it's uh, very simple to derive A prime from A. It's just A times cosine of the elevation angle. And I use the average between E1 and E2 since they're fairly um, close together and it doesn't make much difference. Um, so there's the equations and there's the calibration angle. However, after I determined the calibration angle, uh, I realized that I um, underestimated the angle slightly and here's why. Okay, so I had to come back because there was a little difference. So that's where the tripod was. I analyzed the nighttime image and when I did the Toyota light, I was here and I lined it up. I put the bottle down there. Okay, my Toyota light was about here. And it's in line right there, but there is a gap. There's a gap here of, uh, oh, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five. So the calibration angle was um, underestimated slightly by about, um, you know, 0.004 of a degree. That's 6 over 7 times, uh, you know, the angle for one pixel. And so the final values are shown there. Uh, 3.824, that's the final in radians, 0 0.066741 radians. And uh, in terms of pixels, 851.3 pixels. And so we'll use this value together with... Um, the uh, values derived from imagery to calculate the distance to the stars. Image processing is actually quite simple but somewhat tedious, so I've taken 30 exposures out of the two cameras, left and right. Uh, 1 through 8 were ruined um, as I was moving the camera to the location. So here I'm starting to process L09, left and right. So I copied it from the right over to the left. I'm naming the layer. We have to copy as new layer. And um, we'll, um, we'll uh, change transparency. And the first step is to align Notice the images are not quite aligned, plus they're slightly rotated. So I'm going to use the stars to align and register the images. That's important. We want to <clears throat> use the stars to really get it. Oop, it's a little bit too much. Eh, no, that's not good either. But anyway, we're going to work at it a little bit and get it aligned just right. And then we'll move it to... Um, you know, get the stars right on top of each other. So here's this red star, and I'm going to bring them together. It takes a while here. Uh, let's see. Boom, there we go. So the steps are um, fairly simple. We're going to align to uh, the stars in the center. Then we're going to align the calibration tower. And then we're just going to measure the pixel differences. So here we're going to try to be very precise. I'm going to shift the uh, layer over. There we go. It's overlapping. Yeah, right there. Oh, right there. That's even better. And um, so as we zoom out, we're going to notice that not all the stars are aligned. In the center, they're aligned pretty good. And there's a reason why they're shifted. We can rotate a little bit more and uh, we can work at that. But when we zoom out and we look left and right, we see a glaring difference in the stars. And I'll have a chart to show you why that is, because um, that needs to be taken into account. So now, step two, we are going to align on the tower. Okay, so let's see, boom right there so now I'm going to zoom in and uh, get this aligned um, probably within a pixel that's the best we can do and now I'm gonna toggle left and right a little bit just so I can visually assess when it's aligned 
properly. And um, it's somewhat subjective. The best thing to do is to use a computer and uh, have it, you know, look for it. Oh, right there. That looks excellent. Uh -oh. Okay. No, that's getting out of sync. Going back. I'll go back one more. Um, is that the bit? Yeah, right there. I think that's it. Yeah, so um, that's the process of aligning. And after we align, you know, we're ready to just measure um, the stars. So there's the two red ones. Now it's important to, you know, uh, toggle the layers to make sure <laughs> we're not measuring the wrong stars. It, it can be confusing. However, we were told that uh, the stars are at infinity, so they should be around 851 um, pixels, right? Because that's the calibration angle, so they're at infinity. But as I was measuring around, um, I started to get values around 847, 848, 847. And I thought, what in the world? <laughs> You gotta be kidding me, you know, a uh, small difference, you know, three, four pixels, but it's a difference. And I thought, hmm, this is very interesting. So I decided to embark on um, a statistical study. I have, uh, you know, um, a number of images. There's a number of stars. So I started measuring across the... Um, you know, start field and trying to be as precise as I could. And uh, I started tabulating all the values. But before we get into those, let's have a look at a much uh, easier example. We're going to measure the distance to an aircraft. So here's an example. We're going to measure the distance to the aircraft in uh, the scenery. And there's a few airplanes that pass in front. And we can tell those are airplanes. They have strobe lights. So you see the strobe lights. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so we're just going to take the pixel difference. I exported this image. Notice it's 6,000 by 4,000. I haven't changed it, shrunk it, or anything. So uh, I'm doing this in paint since you can see the pixel measurement. So about 250. So the first step is to calculate the pixel difference uh, based on the calibration angle. So 851 minus 253 pixels equals uh, the number you see there. The next step is simple. We'll convert the pixels to an angle. So one pixel is 0 0.0000784. We multiply that and we get our angle in radians. Since the angle is fairly small, I'm just going to use the small angle approximation. And then step C, we're ready to calculate the distance. Um, D over the angle which gives us 25.4 miles. Very simple. However, if we want to improve the accuracy, there are some things we can do. Um, and it's mainly related to the direction in which we're viewing because the baseline is changing. There is a skew angle as this graphic illustrates. So the aircraft is skewed over about 9.2 degrees from the tower, and that's based on the pixels times uh, the angle of one pixel converted to degrees. And then the tower is 17.55 degrees skewed relative to the road, um, and so we have to account for that. As you can see here, <clears throat> there's the 17.55 degrees relative to the normal of that road, basically the perpendicular line. And um, so that takes us to the tower, and then the aircraft is another 9 degrees beyond that. So the effect that has is it uh, shortens the baseline. You see, D is the baseline along the road, and the red line, D prime, is along the viewing direction to the tower. So the actual distance is slightly closer, 22.7 miles. And I begin to wonder where that airplane is going. It's so close to the mountain. And um, it's like, whoa, watch out, buddy. <laughs> We know from the last video that uh, Carol Lombard was killed right on the other side of that 
tower 70 some feet below the rim oh my god so anyway let's find out the direction that this aircraft is going so i went to the next uh, set of images and the aircraft has now moved and i did the same calculations and now it's really close to that peak and i get 22.1 miles so let's have a look at a map here we go so las vegas zooming in I was about right there. There's the road. Let's see. Let's turn it over. Yep, I just saw the road. Yes, we're somewhere over there. Uh, right where that other small road intersects. Somewhere over there. So um, let me just click measure distance and um, kind of eyeball the direction somewhat. There's the mountain right about there. The tower is right there here so we're gonna go out at some um, slight angle here actually let's just measure it and then um, I'll go eh, is that the angle so it was 22 point um, point seven or so so anyway the aircraft is somewhere around there so let's put it all together now look at this graphic all the information that we can extract so two um, sightings of the aircraft at t equals zero and t equals 30 seconds later okay the two image sets that i analyzed so i got a distance to the aircraft and um you know, based on the angles and where it's at, it's it's fairly approximate, right? I didn't spend too much time for accuracy in the horizontal here, but this is just to illustrate what we can do with the data. And um, <clears throat> we can get the velocity, you know. I measured on the ground 4.6 mile difference in 30 seconds, so it's about 552 miles per hour. And then the elevation, you know, 3.3 degrees, it was very close to the tower, maybe 3.3 five four and that comes out to about uh, 6900 the observation elevation is 3100 so it's about 10,000 right so this aircraft is flying at uh, 10,000 uh, flight level which is not uncommon and my guess is that it came from um, the airport there and then it banked it's a fairly common flight path. I used to fly years ago out to the range, the Nevada Test and Training Range on the classified flights. And we would take off sometimes that way, go right towards the mountain and then bang, and then go down and then up over uh, Pahrump all the way to the TTR, the Tonopah Test Range out there. <clears throat> I used to work on the electronic combat ranges. And I've also flown into Groom Lake, quite a few times in uh, the years I've spent on the range. So, yeah, they just go up and turn over, you know. So now imagine Miss Lombard, man, oh man, you know, flying in the dark, the beacon lights are off, and if your uh, heading is off a little bit, oh my God, <laughs> you're gonna go right into the mountain, which is what happened to her, you know. Just feel so bad about that. She was such a lovely lady. So now that you've tasted the power of this analysis, um, let's have a look at the stars. So while I was measuring around and I started measuring the stars, I was expecting to be very close to 851, maybe 850, maybe 852. And I was blown away when I started measuring values around um, you know, 8449, 848, sometimes 847, you know. Um, and I started wondering, like, what? It's a small difference. Obviously, we're aligning to the tower plus or minus one pixels, but I thought, you know, a pixel or two, maybe that's significant, maybe three pixels. I said, wow, I should pursue this. And I decided since I have so many photos to do a statistical um, analysis of all the stars. And so I spent a lot of time, I've only analyzed uh, maybe about nine or 10 images because it's very tedious. And I put all this data in a spreadsheet. 
Yeah, so using statistics, we can actually, um, you know, improve the uh, measurements. Because here we're really measuring plus or minus one pixel, and it's so subjective. You know, I'm just looking at it and kind of eyeballing it. So, but uh, by doing this over and over, we can improve, as you'll see shortly. So I try to measure stars sort of in the center because there is a skew as we look left and right. Uh, the baseline changes and the stars, um, you know, the distance between them begins to change relative to the alignment, right? In the center between the two towers, that's zero degrees right there. And so if we go from the center of the baseline, um, you know, it's about two degrees to get to the tower on either side. So I try to stay in the center. That's where the stars are nice and crisp and centered, you know. And uh, in, um, because I kind of veered around a little bit plus or minus, that spread out the statistics a little bit. Uh, look at the numbers down below. If we don't correct for the skew angle, um, and we're measuring a star closer to a tower, it's about two degrees, we're off by about 0.51 pixels, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of, you know, measured within that range of, um, you know, plus or minus two degrees or so. I looked at a lot of stars up and down as well. And um, that's uh, that was the experiment, and uh, when I put it all together, it just blew my mind. I entered all the data into a spreadsheet, and um, right away I started to realize as I was putting it in, um, you know, I tried not to be biased. Um, initially I said, I'm just going to write down whatever I see. I'm not going to try to correct it, or, you know, if it's off, it's off. And... I started going and right away just entering it, I said, wow, this thing is biased towards a lower number. Oh my God. And I did a histogram of the data and then wham, 847.63 pixels average. And I calculated the standard deviation and the upper bounds based on 90% confidence interval. So these are standard uh, statistical analysis. There is the equation. Uh, that 1.65 is associated with the 90% uh, confidence interval. And then that's the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of values. And so we get about 0.3 of a pixel, plus or minus 0.3 of a pixel. So uh, um, this is the largest error, our theodolite and surveying, that's, uh, that was the best. Um, so here I have the calibration, 851.3, and the measured from there, the average basically, and there is a delta of pixel, 3.67. It's like, whoa, there's a small delta. And then I calculate the angle. I need the angles. So I multiply um, the delta value of 3.67 with uh, the 0 0.000784 um, radians per pixel to get that angle. That's the angle alpha, basically. Okay? And uh, I also adjust it for the baseline. Okay? And... Um, yeah, let me put that in there so we have it. So angle, that's uh, A prime. That is the angle now to the star, not to the to the tower, to a star, okay? And there's the baseline, 17.55, you know, times 1.19. And now let's calculate the distance to the star. Let's make the text red because this is important. It's going to blow your mind away. Distance to the dome. Okay. So it's going to be the baseline. Okay. Divided by the angle. And wham, 3,943 miles, folks. That is incredibly close to the radius of the Earth, or so-called radius. This just blew my mind, folks. Unbelievable. 
So it's really the distance to the dome, not to the stars. They cannot be that close. I'll say more about that later, but here is the summary. I added also the low average and high table right there, you know, for 90% confidence interval. And there is the assumed Earth radius of 3959. Um, and we only have a delta between my value and this so-called Earth radius of only 16 miles. That just blew my mind. So what's causing all this? Well, look at the inset. We have a divergent lens and starlight travels in uh, in parallel light rays and then diverges out. And we have the camera one and two. And uh, our equations assume a straight line propagation. And so we uh, see the virtual image of the stars that just happens to be at uh, the radius of the Earth, or better said, the radius of the dome. Okay, there's a fine distinction there. Now, if we assume straight line propagation, it's very interesting to do some calculations. So, here's the globe model, okay? And let's assume we can actually get the same value by looking at um, a zero degree elevation, okay? Then this produces about 2,788 mile altitude to the dome from um, around Bogota. It's actually slightly closer, so very interesting. And um, you can think about this some more if we assume zero degrees um, elevation at the observational location, it makes the math easier, right? We have a 90 degree angle right there because it's tangent to the surface, you know, the distance r to the center, distance r up to the point on the surface, and um, so yeah, very, um, very interesting. Now the stars that I measure were somewhere around um, five degree elevation and uh, I'll try to repeat the experiment to see if there's variation uh, with um, um, elevation. Um, but that requires a different setup. Now in the uh, f um, flat earth model, <laughs> yeah, things don't really work out uh, all that well. So um, we know, if you've been watching my channel, you know there is, uh, I advocate for uh, refraction. And uh, what we're observing is um, something that has to do with the curved space time. Um, and uh, possibly the dome and layering. Um, so it's a very fascinating um, thing to pursue. The stars, our only hope. Human action resounds in the heavens. The bell echoes above. What we decide here today will polish or crack the firmament. What shall it be? Human action resounds in the heavens. The bell echoes above. What we decide here today will polish or crack the firmament. What shall it be?